houses. We get a lot of people that really want to flip houses and their biggest question is, oh, where do I find private money? Where do I get these private lenders? I presume you've had to cultivate these relationships to get these lenders. Like these guys just uh, aren't walking down the street, right? We're looking at inventory here. It's a pure flip market for us. There's guys doing what we do, but there's a lot, I feel less competition. So once you can get that first or second one under your belt, I feel like there's a lot of momentum to be gained. Back, 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 back to those days. I was running, 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 running in one place. Set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a pace. Feel like I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been running in one place. Yeah, I've been feeling pretty good. I've been feeling great. I've been feeling how I should, how I really should. Hey, real estate investors. Welcome to another episode of the House Flipping Show here on Holton Wise TV. This is the show where we talk to experienced house flippers as well as brand new house flippers. The whole thing is an educational piece all about getting better at the business of flipping houses. I am your host, James Wise. Behind the scenes is my man, Tommy, editing the footage for us. And today we talk to a guy by the name of Tom. He's out there in Chicago, and this was probably one of the smartest cats I've ever talked to. This guy is running a multi-million dollar side hustle. Let's take a look at the footage now. All right, Tom, you guys, uh, you guys are professional flippers, right? On this show, I talk to everybody. I talk to brand new flippers. I talk to flippers of lost money, guys that are doing it all the time. And you're like at the end of that spectrum. You guys are running a full service flipping business, correct? Uh, that's probably a little generous, but yes, we treat this like a business. Um, this is something that we're looking to to profit in and live off of eventually. Uh, to be clear, though, like I'm still, I got one foot in a W-2 job still, so this is still a very large and heavy side hustle, but it is treated like a business, not just a, hey, we found one property, let's see what we can do with it. Like we treat this as, you know, there is an end game here that we want to accomplish. As of today, as we're uh, talking, how many houses have you flipped? Because you guys sent me, when you guys were interested in coming on the show, you sent me a brochure and you guys had deal after deal and it was all super well put together. And, you know, I was, I was pretty impressed. You guys are clearly pros. So even though it is still somewhat of a side hustle, how many deals are you in right now? So in the last year, like, cause we're doing like our year end stuff right now. It's just, it's just good timing. It's the end of 2019. Uh, we did about 30 transactions this year. So they're not all flips. It's the same process. Some of them we hold though. Um, so we did about 30 rehabs over the last, call it like 14 months, going a little bit back to the end of 2018. So pretty, I mean, for for some people, they look at that and they say it's very small. For me, like that's a giant step for, forward. Like that's a pretty, you know, we're we're happy with where that number is and we're obviously looking to keep it growing. That that to me, I mean, that's that's a pretty it's <laughs> a pretty large amount of transactions. Now, I got two questions. When you say we, who does that entail? And the second question is, what is that W-2 job you're still doing? Sure. So uh, we is me and my general contractor. So we're two separate entities, but like we are a partnership. We do everything together. Um, you know, I, I really don't do deals without them. And we, we need to make sure that both of us see eye to eye on this. And then uh, I'm still in uh, basically a sales job, business development for uh, innovation consultancy in the digital space. Long way of saying we help larger enterprise clients with uh, digital transformations and their different uh, digital, digital stacks, uh, technology stacks, et cetera. A lot of people, when they get into flipping houses, it seems like everybody's got this, like, uh, this dream or this goal, like, you know, look, you got a boss, everybody has bosses, I had bosses. Um, nobody really loves their boss, nobody really loves their job. But everyone seems to have this dream like, oh, I'm just going to quit my job today and then I'm going to start flipping houses tomorrow. And I think that's fool's gold. I, I think people that think that way are, are being far too optimistic. And I think you would probably be a very good case study because the flip we're going to be talking about later, I mean, you made almost $50,000 but you and you've done 30 transactions the last 14 months, but you're still working that job. And I think that's smart. Can you elaborate on why you're still working that job and how important having that W-2 income is to your flipping business. Sure. So I guess the first point is one, I like what I do, right? Like this isn't like uh, wake up and go to work and be like, man, this sucks. Like I'm looking for an outlet. Like I, I thoroughly enjoy my company. I thoroughly enjoy like what I do and working with my clients. So there's not, that's not so much of an escape. 
getting into the real estate, the whole reason I got involved was the long-term wealth. And everyone talks about buy and hold. And I do agree with that. And I do have a nice little portfolio here in Chicago. But there's also a point to it of, you know, you, there's that trade-off of making 200 bucks on the buy and hold, 200 bucks a month, 300 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month, whatever that is per house. You're going to go through the whole process of finding it, rehabbing it, and, and doing the whole nine yards. You might as well do some of the flips in there as well. It's, you know, if you look at it in over like a 10 year period, yes, that buy and hold might, you know, it might take 15 years for that to break even compared to one nice flip. Uh, I'm not starting a war on which one is better, but I think, you know, they're both very valuable and they're both a way to accumulate long-term wealth. You know, we take this money from the flips and we use it to purchase more properties, purchase more rentals. Uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing as someone with a 401k or some, you know, some other long-term means for retirement. That's the way I view it. It's obviously just a little bit more hands-on, a little bit more active than, you know, sitting there and just putting money into an account. Now, with you being the guy um, who's still working that W-2 job, you said you only do your deals with your partner who happens to be a general contractor, which is, you know, super smart. It's how Holton Wise got started. I was the sales guy, Holton. He was the general contractor his whole adult life, and we teamed up. It seems like you got something a little similar. Is your general contractor partner, I would assume, probably more involved in the day-to-day -day operations, of course, of running this real estate business, and you're kind of overseeing it? How does that partnership work? Yeah, absolutely. So we're trying to, even now that we're getting a little bit more active, we're trying to like really define guidelines as opposed to just, I'll do this, you do this, we'll get it done. Um, I think that having that attitude is great, right? Like, you know, whatever the job is, just go get it done. We're starting to try to systematize that a little bit more. So the long-winded answer to your question, yes, he is definitely, he is the day-to-day -day guy on all of this. Once we get a deal running, we sign the contract, we get utilities on, we get the lockbox up, we start demoing it's going to be 80, 20 him to me, right? Like in, it's probably almost reverse on the front end on lead acquisition, networking, getting the financing lined up. Um, so like, you know, the, the latter part that I just mentioned is probably 80, 20 me. And then once we're, once a property is in what I'd call like a rehab state all the way up into staging, it's definitely 80, 20 him. Now, when it comes to the selling, how are you guys selling these? Are, are you guys hiring realtors? What are you guys doing? Yeah, we've partnered with the realtor on on all of these so far, and he's been great. He's uh, came referred into my GC from a past life. They've worked together. Uh, someone who knows the north side of Chicago very well uh, comes very highly recommended, um, and we pull him in. We'll pull him in on the front end, so we'll purchase something. Even if we're purchasing direct from the homeowner, we'll pull him in and say, hey, look at this. Are we off on the ARV? What do we got to look out for? Should we do a 100K rehab here, or should we just do a 50K rehab? What if we do this? What if we finish the basement? What if we don't? Like we, we look to solicit him early and often. And then obviously he'll get his cut on it when we go to sell. Like he, he'll get his, um, you know, five percent, you know, half of 5% or however that him and the other uh, agent negotiate. How important do you think it is for your flipping business to have that strong relationship with that realtor going into it? I see a, a lot of folks are trying to, uh, you know, eke out as much profit as possible. Do you think he pays for himself or what's your opinion on that? Yes, I, I agree. I I think a hundred percent. Yes. Uh, it, you know, it's, I you I've signed those selling settlements. So it's like, geez, that's a lot of commission, you know, especially if they get both sides of it, if they're involved in the purchase and if they're involved in the back end, it's like, there's, there's times they can make more than you, you can on this, but they're also working for that. They're saving your ass on the front end. It's almost like an insurance policy. And then two, you know, I'm, I also don't want, you know, if you talk about, Hey, let's eke out the profit. Let's do this ourselves. Like, I don't want to spend my Saturdays sitting at open houses. I don't want to be sitting there on the phones, you know, calling people who came through and, and holding hands for first time buyers coming out of an apartment that are, you know, complain about every little detail in a home like that. That doesn't sound like fun to me. That is something I'll gladly augment to another professional. Absolutely. And now let's get into the details on the specific split or the specific flip you guys did, because you guys are clearly in the luxury market. I mean, your numbers, uh, you know, your acquisition cost was 335 208 In a lot of markets around the USA, that's actually the exit price of the market or even higher than the exit price sometime. But that's just your acquisition cost. And you guys ended up selling this for over half a million dollars. If you could walk me through how you acquired this flip, where did you find it? What made you decide to do this deal? Sure. So we like this area. There's, I'll call it four or five zip codes on the north side that are almost predominantly flips for us. And when I say predominantly flips, meaning 
the acquisition price versus what you can rent it for just don't don't work. There's other areas in Chicago where the acquisition prices are lower and we'll either look to flip there or those are the ones that we can do buy and hold because we'll be able to cover our expenses and you know cover the capital expenditure, et cetera, and, and be in a good spot. In these upper end areas on the north side, there's not the rental doesn't uh, doesn't cover the the higher end acquisition price if that makes sense if I'm articulating that correctly. So these are pure what we'd call if we're looking at inventory here, it's a pure flip market for us. Uh, so this is in one of those zip codes that is a pure flip area. And what we found and what's kind of a nice little niche for us is a lot of these homes. There's going to be a lot of people who are I'll call it ground up developers. They're going to take this home, they're going to tear it down, and they're going to build a 3,200 square foot. I'll call it McMansion for lack of better words, but a luxury home and sell it for 1.2, 1.4, something along those lines in a great area with a great school district. Where we like to come in is find that same home and sell it, you know, keep the 1,700 square foot layout, 1,500 square foot layout, whatever, and do a full rehab of it, not change the square footage at all, not do, you know, not make it that, that oversized house. And then look to sell it for five or six, be basically half of that land development in the same area. And it's going to be someone moving in that has one kid, maybe two kids, but that can live with just, hey, three beds. It's a little crowded compared to like what I can get out in the burbs, but I'm in the city. I like it and I can afford it for, you know, comparing it to a 1.2 or 1.4. This makes much more sense for our family and, you know, we're good to go here. So there's guys doing what we do, but there's a lot, I feel less competition. Um, there's a lot of inventory out there for non-updated, and then it goes all the way up to the like the new, like I said, those giant ones that are in the seven figures. So this is a nice little niche to provide an awesome product in an awesome neighborhood. Um, you're just getting that square footage that you know everyone would desire, but for the price point, there's a demand for it, and that's that's where we look to play. Now that three thirty five. How did you guys go about financing that or splitting that amongst you and your GC partner? Yeah, so I take care of all the finances on, on the front end. He, his job is to ensure he hits his rehab budget and that the rehab goes well. Like that is, I don't put any of the front end stuff on him. It's on me to find the, the, find the deal and fund the deal. That is, and finding the deal, he works on that as well with me. So I don't want to say that's 100% me. So we find this deal. We have a hard money line that we use. Um, we have a, actually we have a couple of different options for this one specifically. It was a hard money line. Uh, I believe they did 100% of the rehab and 85% of the purchase. Um, so if you, I don't have that pulled up in front of me, but 85% of that 335, and then 100% of that 105 rehab or whatever that number was. And okay. then I, I, I come. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just, yeah, I was just going to say, so, okay, so your job is to line all that up. So between uh, the 335 purchase price and then the $105,000 uh, reno budget, you, you handle figuring out how you get all that money, whether it's your, I assume since you found a hard money lender that loaned you 85% of that, I assume you probably just put the other 15% up yourself. And your GC partner, he don't need to worry about that. That's just, that's what you bring to the table along with the line to the capital. That is correct. And just to take it one step further, we also have, uh, I'll call them private investors, but only on the debt side. So we, we've done promissory notes as well. Um, so I've, I've pulled those in as well. So regardless, so that is my, that is my area. Like I am responsible for however we come up with the funds for this. Very cool. And, and this is something I want to I wanna dive a little deeper with you because I really like this because we get a lot of people that really want to flip houses and their biggest question is, oh, where do I find private money? Where do I get these private lenders? It's, it's not like uh, ordering a pizza though, right? You can't just go on the yellow pages and be like, hey, Domino's, I need a large pepperoni pie here, right? I presume you've had to cultivate these relationships to get these lenders. Like these guys just uh, aren't walking down the street, right? Is this... Um, we're working like a nice high end W2 job. Like you uh, work those networking with those types of people. Does that come into play? Like, where'd you find these guys? Yeah, it absolutely comes into play twofold. One, finding the actual people who are, you know, who have money, right? Like you want to be, you want to be swimming in the correct pool. And then two, they've seen me succeed in my job, right? Like, I think it's very hard for someone's like, you know, what? I'm just going to start flipping houses and you have no track record of anything. Like, I think it's much easier to come in and say, hey, I have a track record of being successful. It might be completely unrelated to this industry, but I have that track record and they believe in you and they trust in you. So I think that's one of the biggest things I have going for me. And then when you talk about like, I'll call it institutional money, but actual hard money lenders, 
once you have that first or second deal done, you know, you're all of a sudden ahead of like, whatever, a, a large number of people who are out there wishing they do this or sit on bigger pockets thinking about getting in. Like there's a huge, there's a lot of people who are sitting at zero homes. So once you can get that first or second one under your belt, I feel like there's a lot of momentum to be gained there. I forgot who, I think it's Jay Scott or someone who said they've never met someone who flipped one home. Like you either, <laughs> you either get into it or you don't. <laughs> now, Let's talk about, let's shift for me a little bit and kind of talk about the actual rehab, the stuff your partner's handling. That's a big old rehab, yeah. man, $105,000. We're going to put some photos on the screen for you all to take a look and actually see what Tom is talking about. But Tom, walk me through what you guys did to this property. Because, you know, another thing, a lot of people, sometimes they think it's just painting walls, painting cabinets. Well, that ain't necessarily the case. To actually eke out a profit of almost $50,000 like Tom did, you got to do a lot of work to this. So if you could walk us through what y'all did. Sure. So when we're looking at inventory, the biggest thing we want to see is like a, a care of, I know we're all looking for distressed homes, right? Like that's, you know, we all, oh, it's dilapidated. There's, there's someone who's in need. But we also want great bones on this thing. We want a homeowner who is taking care of the property so we can minimize the amount of mechanics and I'll call it the non-sexy stuff that an end user is not going to care about, right? Because if, if a lot of your budget goes to that, that's, that's going to be rough. So like on this one here, we did, obviously it's much more than just a cosmetic rehab. It's not just the paint, carpet, you know, trim, et cetera. There's a lot more that goes into it. But at the same token, you know, we didn't really touch the outside. We painted the siding. It was, she had recited it probably about 10 years ago. Same thing with the roof. It was done. Like there's a couple things that check the box for us where it's like, all right, that takes the rehab that would have been, whatever, 120 down to 100, it makes this number work for us. Um, that all being said, yeah, this is still a, a large rehab. We're touching a lot of different parts here, um, you know, including things like the trick, the plumbing, you know, stuff that really is going to give you dollar for dollar when you go to sell this thing. Um, however, when you still make the numbers work, like by all means, go for it. I think one of the, one of the things we did a very nice job with on this one is the, we opened up the kitchen. Um, I know that sounds very simple, but like this was a home that was pretty cramped and we made it look pretty damn big uh, combined with the staging efforts from our third party that staged it. Like the home felt a lot homier and felt a lot larger than when we purchased it. Uh, so I think that was probably one of the biggest things for us. Uh, another one was just the, the upstairs. We went back and forth on, you know, what to do up there. And I think, I think we sent a few of the pictures, but we ended up doing hardware up there as our, I'm sorry, hardwood flooring up there instead of carpets. Um, ended up uh, adding a master closet. Like there's probably some things we could have done up there to trim our budget and maybe save 10 grand, but would have definitely hurt us in the long run uh, on the resale value. Now, when you guys are doing flips, cause I mean, you guys, it's a beautiful home. It's a luxury home. I mean, you guys are, you know, if we're looking nationwide, you guys, I, you know, I understand there's more expensive areas of Chicago, but you know, you're above half a million dollar exit price here. So this would be what many would consider the luxury market. How do you go about choosing the fixtures that you chose? Uh, look, it's trial and error. <laughs> so we've, we, we have, we have messed this up both ways. We have done on our, on our higher end ones here, we have undershot ourselves and on some of my rentals in, I'll call them, uh, you know, areas that have a lower home value, we've overshot and overdone it and not gotten that bang for our buck. So we've, we've messed it up on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, this is one where we feel, feel pretty good about it too. Same thing with like cabinets and like even the tiles and, you know, just a, a lot of these little intricacies that a couple thousand here, a couple thousand here, but it really could make a difference. Um, it's, it, it's from that trial and error that we're in a much better spot now. And this is one, if I had to go back in time, like we would be pulling in the realtor a lot earlier on these questions. You know, we ask them about, hey, what happens if we finish the basement or what happens if we add a bath here? But from the get-go, we should have been asking, what finish should we use here? What, if, you know, given the cops are using us, what finishes are they? Just so we know that we're in line or exceeding uh, market expectations. And I see you went with the stainless steel appliance package. Would you say that uh, providing appliances is an absolute must every time you sell one of these homes? Every time we sell, yes. Uh, what's weird in Chicago in certain neighborhoods, we'll get away with the rentals with uh, tenant providing. So it's one of those, if we go to actually not flip it, and, but rent it and hold it, we can get away with it. And that obviously drops your kitchen a lot. Um, but no, it's, it's an absolute necessity on, on these ones to sell. It, it, as, as much as people, you might argue with yourself internally and say, oh, but they can buy it and do it exactly how they want. People cannot vision it. 
Like they just, they have too much trouble. Like they need to see the finished product. Um, they need to be able to walk through and say, okay, yeah, this is, this is awesome. This is, this is for lack of a better word, turnkey for me and I can just move in. Yeah. I mean, kitchens and baths sell houses. And when you're in the kitchen, the appliance package is what sells it, man. People want to see that beautiful looking thing. Now, another thing for uh, flippers out there listening to this show, a lot of people, they flip houses and they think, okay, my sales price minus my purchase price minus my renovation. So that'd be in your case, that'd be 560 minus your 335 purchase price, your 105 renovation. But what a lot of folks seem to forget about is there's a lot of additional costs coming when you actually hold the property for some time and then you actually sell the property. You guys spent a little bit over $71,000 on your selling and holding costs. Can you walk us through what exactly that $71,000 paid for? Sure. Yeah, it's uh the big one is going to be realtors, right? Like if you're just take 5% of that 560, that's a pretty big no number right there. You're in the 20s, 25k, 27k, something like that. So right off the bat, you have the realtor fees. Uh as we mentioned, we use the hard money line and it's expensive, but you know what you're getting into. Like that is it's in line with what other lenders in the market are, so we know it's, you know, I'm not it's not them specifically, just the hard money lender in general. You're going to be paying a lot of interest. This is a longer rehab. And we talk about timeline too, you got to factor in your rehab, the time it's going to be on the market. And then you also, I and mean, people always forget this, that last 30 days of them just getting the loan, right? Like it's just, you add all that up and it's like, geez, this, you know, it's three, four grand a month over a seven month period or whatever the numbers are. And you're at, you know, you can, you can get to 30 K very, very quickly. Um, I think one thing in retrospect too, this product was really, really good. And we ended up close to our original ARV, but when the product was finished, we got excited and listed it higher than we originally were going to. And it sat for a month and then we went back to our game plan. So we also, we burned a month on the front end because we got excited about it, um, which just shows you like stick to your gut, stick to your numbers type of thing. Uh, but we took a shot and you know, whatever, it didn't work. Uh, but you know, you, you accumulate another month of holding costs there. But to answer your question, the, the majority of it is you're closing twice. You're closing on the purchase. You're closing on the sale. The realtor commission, holding, um, and holding meaning both the origination from the, the lender and then you're holding every month, um, holding both the lending costs and utilities and taxes, which I think taxes on this one were like six or seven hundred bucks a month as well. I, I really like what you said there about you guys got excited and then you you got – for lack of a better term, I guess we'll call it, you got a little greedy, right? We've all, we've all done this. Anybody I thought it was a nice game, word of greedy. <laughs> <laughs> we've all done this, right? Anybody who's been in the game, you're like, damn, that's a nice property. You're feeling yourself a little bit. And you try to list it a little higher than you should. And, you know, guys, if you're out there, listen to your realtors. Uh, realtors, you know, sometimes <laughs> you, get, you get folks that are not in the real estate game, and, you, and you'll listen to them complain about the realtors like, ah, Billy Bob Realtor couldn't sell my house. He listed it for too high and it never sold. Nine times out of 10, guys, the realtor's never the person advocating it, selling it for too high, right? It's always the, the seller, the owner of the property who's trying to get a higher price. And I've learned this, uh, you know, this the hard way. Tom learned it the hard way. Go at the lower price, guys. You, you, you offer the property at the lower price. You're going to sell it quicker. You're going to create more demand. Uh, it's going to create competition. Selling, listing a property for too high of a price point almost never ever ever pays off at least it's never paid off for me and it sounds like that's your experience as well tom yeah 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 we got greedy and <laughs> ended up paying another month of holding costs <laughs> yeah it happens but other than that man this was a this was a hell of a deal you guys crushed this you ended up netting forty seven thousand seven hundred fifty nine dollars the house looks beautiful this is great Discount Property Warehouse, founded by real estate visionary Robert Thiel, author of The Short-Term Retirement Program, is a complete turnkey solution for acquiring cash-flowing investment properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Our turnkey properties include a third-party home inspection, new HVAC with 10-year warranties, new dimensional roofs, competitive price-to-rent ratios, discounted property insurance, in-house property management, private financing, and much more. At Discount Property Warehouse, we have a staff of licensed agents standing by, ready to assist you with every aspect of the process. Call us today or visit us online at discountpropertywarehouse.com. What's next for you guys in your business? What, what, what happens from here? Well, currently we're, so right now it's December of 2019. We have two flips on the market. We're just closing on another one this Friday. So for us, that's a pretty, 
that's a pretty good, if we have three projects going on in some capacity, like for us, that's a pretty good workload. Um, anything more than that might be a little scary. Um, and yeah, we'd, you know, keep it going. If we can keep that velocity and just kind of go where the market goes and we, we'd be very happy with that. So there's not, there's not a, like a 10 X, like we're going to build out this giant business. I don't think that's in the cards for us. I think, uh, you know, a slow and steady scale for us though is, is good. Um, we don't, the nice thing about working is we don't have to do a deal just to do a deal, right? If 10 great deals come across our desk next month, cool. We'll find a way to make it happen. If nothing comes across for three months, cool. Like that sucks, but we'll live with it. We're not living and dying off the income from these deals. Absolutely. You're more or less supplementing your income. Do you plan on continuing to work in your normal day job for the unforeseeable, for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I do. Like I, it's something I like. It's something I enjoy. Um, the other thing too, that's important is, uh, you know, I've to be very candid, like I, I wasn't investing in 2008 and 2009. I haven't seen a downturn here yet. Right. So there's part of me that says, Hey man, you're doing a great job, but there's also part of me that's realistic that, well, you haven't gone through the bad times yet. <laughs> you've only been living in, you know, you, you've been living in this rosy environment. That's probably not going to stick around forever. So there's the realist, the realist it within me that thinks, Hey, like, you know, there's, there's some security there and there's, it's not just so much security. It's if you enjoy doing it, there's no reason to, it's, it's a waste of money to throw it away. Absolutely. I think real estate is a great business because it can be a, an ancillary business to your overall wealth building strategy. You know, you get to separate your eggs uh, in many baskets and like the way you've worked it out, you've leveraged what you do really well. And then you found someone else and leverage what they do really well. There's no need for you to be supervising subs and, and handling guys who are painting and yelling at guys about trim work or, you know, Nick and this or Nick and that you found a guy who does that all the time. And he's probably much better at it than you. You're able to rub elbows with these other folks that have access to a lot more capital. So I think you guys are doing this the right way. If any of my fans want to reach out to you or want to follow your story, see what you got going on next Tom. Where can they do that at? Sure. Uh, I'm always love. I love talking about this stuff. Like it's awesome. So feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm on bigger pockets all the time. You can find me there. Uh, James, I know you're obviously huge there. That's how, that's how we connected. Uh, email address is just N is in Nancy S is in Sam properties, plural. So P R O P E R T I S seven, two, three at Gmail. Um, yeah. Hit me up. I'm more than happy to talk. All right. Special thanks to Tom for coming on the show and telling us his story. If you guys are interested in following along with what Tom is doing, or perhaps you're a seller who's in Chicago and you're looking for an investor to come buy one of your distressed properties, I have put the way that you can contact Tom in the show notes below. I'm sure he would love to hear from you, or you can follow him online where he talks about his business. Everybody else out there, if you're interested in telling us your story about a property that you flipped, you can be a cat like Tom running a normal day-to-day -day job, but also running a pretty large flipping business on the side. You could be a brand new flipper. You could be somebody doing it full-time. Any and everybody who's interested in flipping houses, we want to hear from you. So post in the comments below what your house flipping experiences are. And if we're interested in your story, we may invite you on to do your very own episode of the House Flipping Show. As always, I'm James Wise with Holton Wise, and this is Real Estate Investing Made Easy. Back, 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 back to those days. I was running, 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 running in one place. Set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a pace. Feel like I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been running in one place. Yeah, I've been feeling pretty good. I've been feeling great. I've been feeling how I should, how I really should. Rent Tech Direct provides you with an easy to use yet robust platform for managing your properties, complete with its built-in reporting and accounting system that can be customized to fit your business. You can manage work orders and even accept them online from your tenants. You can also share work order details with tenants or owners if you wish. With Rent Tech Direct, you will also fill your vacancies faster than ever with the built-in marketing tools. Just enter the details of your property and Rent Tech will automatically provide you with a professional online website as well as syndicate them to popular websites such as Zillow, Trulia, and Apartments.com to get your listing maximum exposure so it's rented fast.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our latest content, including video tours and analysis of investment properties that are available for sale, real estate investment education, and our most interesting encounters with tenants from health. Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy.